and welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and SDC take on topical and controversial stories, but keep it edgy yet light-hearted. Podcasts share their desert island drugs and joyful patient stories. Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. For this episode, we're joined by Dr. Nikki Umaru. Nikki is a principal lecturer in clinical pharmacy whose interests include patient and medication safety and medicines optimization in vulnerable patient groups. We will welcome Nikki in a moment as she shares a drug for the oral apothecary formulary, her career anthem and recommends a book for our library. Our micro discussion this week looks at polypharmacy and hyperpolypharmacy in the very old as we discuss the findings from the Newcastle 85 plus study. But first, let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries. STC is in Bournemouth and Gimmo is in Cardiff. Nice of you to show up, Gimmo. What have you been up to? Well, do you know what? I go away for one episode and come back and we're being sued by the BBC. So so maybe <laughs> maybe, 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 I, maybe I won't go again because I think without my supervision, who knows what will happen. <laughs> so for those who don't know what I'm talking about, you have to listen to last week's episode. Um, but thank you to Claire for stepping in. At very, very, it was very short notice. It was very short notice. But um, my son had a football game and it was his last football game as a as a youth player and um I just didn't want to miss it and thank you very much and I think she did a great job as well she did hey while um, we're talking about football come on Wales have made the World Cup finals in Qatar yeah I know it's great that'll be that'll be an interesting winter no so um so it's been a while since the last one hasn't it so um I guess the only thing I'd mentioned because I don't think you mentioned it last week is is between me seeing you last we were at the clinical pharmacy congress and we did another live show there um, and actually, we bumped into Nikki there, didn't we? Um, but it was fantastic. Um, so thank you for those who came along to that. It was really good fun. We got some ideas about what we might do for the future of the podcast. And one of those is perhaps involve you, the listener, a bit more in the show in terms of submitting questions and um, topics to talk about. So what we're thinking about is perhaps in a month or so, we'll have a special episode, um, perhaps with a panel as opposed to a single guest. And we'll go through some of your questions. So, so we'll start engaging on Twitter. You've got our email address. Have a think about what you might want to talk about. And who knows, you might get your name on the Oral Apothecary podcast. And actually, we should just call out Karen Harrowing, who was very usefully on Twitter. We were talking about the HSIB, the episode before last. In fact, we, Gimmo and I were putting the boot in a little bit, as was the D&T Bulletin podcast this week, actually, about the HSIB. However... Karen did point out to us and didn't realise this. We were saying how it would be much better, surely, if they were independent and had more teeth. And thank you, Karen, has pointed out to us that actually that's part of the new Health and Care Act that's coming into position in July in England. So hopefully they will get some more independent teeth. So that's good. And I was just going to say, I also came across this week, I don't know if you guys know about this, but you know Philip Morris, the company? Tobacco. Yeah. Did you know that they've now bought a company called Vectura, which is a company that specializes in inhaled medication technology. And guess what? They're not called the oral apothecary, are they? No. Now that Vectura is owned by Philip Morris, sales of these products will result in income going to the tobacco industry. And these involve some big hitters like all the GSK Ellipta and the Novartis Breezehaler and a couple of others. I was shocked when I heard that. And there's a statement from the Asthma UK, British Thoracic Society, RPS, and a couple of others endorsing and sort of giving information to patients saying, look, if you feel strongly about this and you need to speak to your health professional. I don't have any more details on that, but for those societies and groups to come out and say that, you know, they bought this company and therefore potentially profits are going to Philip Morris. Interesting, hey? So we're going to get sued by them as well now. I, I, do you know what? I, I, sorry, I know we're, I know we're wittering on. Did you see in the news today about they're going to copy what they've done, I think, in New Zealand and raise the smoking age by... So so basically, anyone born from today will never legally be able to buy a cigarette or something. That, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, it's been a massive change in relation to smoking-related illnesses after all these changes. So, yeah. Jane, what have you, what have you been up to this week? I've got Book Club this week. And so I've read a few books since we've been off air. Look, Jeremy Hunt's Zero... Eliminating Unnecessary Deaths in a Post-Pandemic NHS. So that's his manifesto for his leadership uh, run-in. Did he mention the HSIB and how he came up with the idea? It's all in there. It's a good read, actually. You'll know it all. And there's some familiar cases in there, some high-profile cases in there. And so Elaine Bromley and Martin Bromley, uh, 
there's a chapter on those and Joshua Titcombe, there's a chapter on James and Joshua's story. I've got some strong biases to get over before I can read that. <laughs> some very uh, emotional, but it is worth a read. And then what's definitely worth a read then is by The Power of Teamwork by Brian Goldman, who's the emergency room physician and broadcaster from Canada. If you haven't watched Brian's TED Talk on Doctors Make Mistakes, can we talk about that? Then that's essential watching. We'll put it in the show notes, already watched by 1.7 million. You talked about it in a previous episode, Jamie, and I'm trying to remember. Was it? No, it's gone. But the new book is new, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a real uh, different insight into, um, you know, teams. I know it's very popular at the moment, and we watch one of our colleagues from Complex Wales um, on Twitter with his uh, view of leadership and and teams and things like that. And are you a real team? Are you a group? We might come on to it later. So I think the conversation between Helen Bevan and Ben Allen and Complex Wales has been fascinating over on Twitter the last couple of days. And then finally, before we introduce our guest, look, um, two of our regular listeners, and that's a cheeky assumption from me, were awarded OBEs in the Queen's Birthday Honours. Congratulations to Mark Donovan, Chief Pharmacist at Boots, and Andrew Evans, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer at Welsh Government. Yeah, indeed. Congratulations off also go to Sumit Matharu, who's the Chief Pharmacist for Defence Primary Healthcare at the Ministry of Defence. She also got an OBE for services to the armed forces. Sounds like a future guest as well. Mm. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, pharmacists turn up in the most unlikely of places. Okay, let's move on. It's our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nikki Umaru to the Oral Apothecary. Nikki is currently the Pharmacy Foundation Head of School, Interim Education and Training Lead at Health Education England, East of England region. She's also the Postgraduate Pharmacy Team Lead at the University of Hertfordshire. The PhD focused on medicines optimization in the older population, particularly around medicines related problems as a cause of hospital admission. She was also appointed as the lead for medication safety in older people's network by the Eastern Academic Health and Science Network, where she describes the community conversation about medicines initiative. Basically, you asked to be invited to a meeting where older people usually gather to chat, have tea and eat cake. You get to talk to them about their medicines for about an hour or longer usually, and listen to some great stories that emerge about medicines use and other interesting topics. These conversations with patients, carers, and members of the public around medicines have been a constant throughout her career. She was one of the 12 female pharmacy professionals identified in the Pharmaceutical Journal's Women to Watch list for 2021. Welcome, Nikki. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks. Looking forward to the conversation. Having a chat with patients and eating cake, that sounds uh, that sounds great, Nikki. Very jubilee. Well, I think, yes, I've come into the right profession because I then have access to patients to talk to them about uh, eating cake and um, medicines uh, so that's a good combination I found that that's what I enjoy doing um, some colleagues perhaps find it a bit uh, daunting to have conversations because most of the time it probably doesn't relate to medicines but um, if there's an opportunity to do that I gladly take it on and so um, when I was working within the hospital sector, I was uh, very happy when I got allocated to the, um, what we used to call the elderly care ward, but it's not called that anymore. Um, when I'm politically correct, <laughs> all the people was <laughs> care. Um, but I always loved going to that ward and I, I enjoyed my um, rotation on that ward and then got reassigned to um, a rehabilitation ward for older people. And then, you know, I even had more opportunities to talk to them alongside doing the normal day job. Yeah, it's been a constant thread through. And um, I still practice and still enjoy doing that. That's what this podcast is trying to be, Nikki. It's a conversation with people about their relationship with their medicines. So yeah. you're spot on. And you've got a very broad base, haven't you? You've worked in lots of different areas. Obviously, older people it was something that we all talked a lot about on this podcast. But one of the things I was really wanting to ask you about was this MedCam. So this is the medication consultation aid memoir that you've been working on, I think. Um, perhaps you could explain to us a little bit about that and to the listeners, because this is trying to help patients, isn't it, or carers before they have a consultation. How did that all happen? So this came about whilst I was the, with the Eastern Academic Health Science Network, where I was working with um, a patient group, actually, um, during my time there. And um, whilst I was doing the community conversations about medicines initiative, um, it came through that very often patients would like to have more conversations with their healthcare team, could be doctor, pharmacist, nurse. But sometimes it's getting the... Um, 
courage to start the conversation or how to put it in a way that they feel it would be um, acceptable to the professional. Um, so uh, they are lay, so no one's expecting them to you know, be aware of all the jargons that we use. But um, sometimes they're really sort of reluctant to start that conversation um, and really ask about medicines. I don't know if you get the same reaction, but when I go in those meetings or when I meet someone for the first time and I say I'm a pharmacist, you either get loved, you know, and, you know, like, oh my goodness, you're a pharmacist. Um, right, this is what I take and these are the issues. Or you get the, oh my goodness, the pharmacist I met, um, the pharmacy where I go to, the queues are always out the door. Or um, when I was in hospital, um, the pharmacy delayed my medicines, I actually missed the transport and I couldn't get home. So you either get one of two reactions. So from the conversations I was having, it became apparent that if there's a way where perhaps we can enlighten patients more in how to start those conversations, you know, make them feel comfortable at ease to start those conversations to um, find out a bit more about how to use their medicines. Um, and if they're not very knowledgeable about using them, how to ask the questions without any fear of being judged, um, they're, not, they're not doing the right things. Um, so I work with the patient group and we came up with, if you like, a, a tool um, that we thought could help have this conversation. And it, it does cover things like, um, you know, really asking the, yourself as the patient or their carer um do I know the medicines I'm on um what they're for what they're indicated for do I know if they're still relevant for me to keep taking them um am I having any side effects um um you know do I is there any monitoring that I require to do that I can do myself or any that I need to sort of uh, be aware of um that needs to, so those sort of conversations and if I'm not using my medicines anymore what do I do with them it, it it's, it's basic things really, but structured in a way that they put it in their own words and that way you can have that conversation with them. And I think that's fascinating. I suppose my question was, are you evaluating this? You know, have you actually started the evaluation yet? Or? So we will shortly start doing that soon. Um, so I've got to one of my research students who's helping out with that and hopefully we will start evaluating its use in reality. Um, it's been through patient groups and they're, they're happy with the framework, the tool, um, but obviously it's only useful if it does make a difference in the real world. So that's the next step and that's what we're working on at the moment. We had Delathon last week, didn't we? Um, there's some powerful psychology, behavioural psychology going there around priming people for that conversation. There, so I think that's brilliant. But Jamie, you've used the term, I think, medicines coach in, in the past. And this feels a bit like this is helping that coaching conversation um, and, and, it, and it's part of, it could be part of a package of how we better coach people to, to take their, or work with people and coach them to help them to take their medicines or understand their medicines. Sounds really good. There's a few things there with the coaching, isn't there? There's asking good questions. If you're going to ask good questions of somebody, you've got to then listen. And that's that's the bit that uh, we all find tough. So, you know, real real listening and is a tough one. Lucy Pollock tweeted something yesterday and I then retweeted it, which was, it was what matters to you day 2022 yesterday. Did you see that? Yeah, the video from NHS Scotland was brilliant, wasn't it? NHS Scotland does do a lot of stuff really well around using because they, they involve patients and advocates and have done for a long time, actually, in all the guidance that they do. And there's a piece in the video where it says, great care begins with a great question. What matters to you? Really good. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, won't it, how you, you know, you're going to be evaluating it, what, in community pharmacies or general practice situations or, or what? So at the moment, we're still scoping, which for me, be all the patient groups, isn't it? Because that's where you get most of the... Um, population with uh, polypharmacy um, and they tend to have the difficulty in being upfront with the questions that they have um, but we are trying to um, uh, evaluate it in um, different settings so community pharmacy, GP practice, um, possibly hospital as well but pro most probably our patient um, clinics those, those sort of settings to see um, to, to to ensure that we get, if you like, um, a good base of, you know, patients and different types of patients and where they're at um, in terms of medicine to use. And it could be, you know, the GP surgery could be, you know, prescribing new medicines and the pharmacy could be 
prescribing new medicines as well, but also um, supporting them in using the medicines. Um, so it's just uh, the different settings probably provide a broad um, sort of a view of how practical it is to use just by meeting different types of um, patients, I suppose, in their healthcare journey. Yeah. Is it good old fashioned pen and paper? Um, well, <laughs> Or probably um, distribute the tool and then ask for um, for people to use it and then provide us with feedback, um, probably using an online system to um, because they have to utilise it first. So we'll give them some time to put it to use and then provide us with feedback on how useful it is or how unuseful it is. <laughs> Yeah. Surgeries have done similar things for a while, haven't they? So I know in our surgery, this post has always been about for older and frail people saying, you know, have a think about what are the three questions that you want to answer when you go into the consultation, because time goes like that, doesn't it? So it does. And frequently, the concern they have is they're very conscious about the 10 minutes that the GP has, and they don't want to infringe on someone else's 10 minutes. And so some of those questions, they don't raise it up because they've only got 10 minutes. There's a fantastic campaign at ages ago, Ask About Medicines, I think. Similar but different, but it, but it was very, I mean, there's lots of good spin-offs of it as well, but it was essentially that, you know, it was a massive campaign of asking the three questions, and I can't remember what they are now, but but it was less sophisticated one that you're describing, but I think similar in philosophy, which was, you know, uh, make sure you ask these three questions about your medicines. Nikki, I think the National Overprescribing Report in England, I'm sure you're aware, but they'll be looking for things like this. So I know Graham Prestwich, who's one of the patient advocates on that group, and he, up in the Northeast, have had an It's OK to Ask campaign which is similar ideas. So if you're not, if you haven't connected with that, they're, they're, that's, out, that's out there. It's okay to ask. But the overprescribing Tony Avery, for example, the, the czar, I think he's called a czar, you know, they're going to be looking for something that's been properly evaluated. So that sounds good. So give us a few more years, hopefully get some results for you. Let me flip that for a moment, because in that book by Brian Goldman, there's a lovely chapter on visual thinking strategies where they take medical students and look at pieces of art and they start it off as a workshop. And it's all about how we train our clinicians with pattern recognition to look for what we're looking for and to use all those and the mind lines. But actually this exercise, this visual thinking strategy of, of looking at a piece of art and then asking the room what do you see? And everybody sees something differently. And it's a really clever chapter on how you start off by taking the medical students across to the museum to look at art, and then you bring it back into a clinical setting then about, you know, again, not narrowing down too quickly and actually staying on that sort of macro level of, well, what matters here? So it is a fascinating chapter. I remember, Jane, when you did something like that, when I gave you, I had some slides that I used years and years ago for teaching medical students and postgraduate doctors about the difference between a clinical trial patient and a real patient and and I had this beautiful picture didn't I of an old fella in a ward in a bed with his nasal specs for his oxygen holding an orange eating it with a spoon eating it with a spoon that's it and I used it all the time and then for the, my clinical trial patient I had this beautiful person airbrushed and the doctor and the nurse, they were all beautiful and handsome and airbrushed as well. I would used it for years and then I showed it to Jamie and then he told me one day that that's what he'd been doing with it. He would put it up and then he'd say, well, what did you, like basically, what do you see here? What 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 do you think's going on here? That's the same idea, right? Great fun with that workshop. Yeah, exactly. And then all of our biases and prejudices come out then about what we see in the picture and what we think, what we think is going on. Yeah. And like Lucy Pollock said, I suppose, a couple of episodes ago, you know, that's the point, isn't it? Old people, older people have got a real life. And if you talk to them and you listen to them, that you'll find some fascinating stuff. And so don't don't treat them as that homogenous group. I think you described that, Gimmo, didn't you, when we talked to Lucy? And um, isn't it great that older person could eat an orange, Jamie? Which is something right back to episode <laughs> one. Like, it goes back do. to episode one. Well done, Gimmo. You know, the golden thread of the Oral Apothecary podcast. <laughs> the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. Right. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you, Nikki. And I'm sure you're aware that one of the pleasures of coming onto the Oral Apothecary podcast is usually to offer something that we're now not able to call 
because <laughs> we're... so what are we, so what 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 are we going to call it? So we can't call it. The, well, the... first of all, our meeting with the, our meeting with the BBC legal department was like an episode of W One A before the they came on screen. It was a, a black screen, and all we could hear was the word "shit, shit, shit" as they <laughs> announced themselves <laughs> to the meeting. So that was that was a highlight for me. Yeah. It was. So here's where we need a bit of interactivity as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll try some names out over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we've had a couple of um, executive level meetings of the oral apothecary. We haven't been able to agree a name, have we? So, so, so over to you listeners to come up with a, to come up with a We name. need to invite STC to those meetings. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. So all I'm going to say is, you know, the score, we're looking for a drug that evokes a powerful memory for you and call it what you like at this stage what would you like to offer us because it is definitely going in the oral apothecary formulary sure um uh, for me that will be tamazepam i'm sure you've had quite a few control drugs Mm, we haven't had tamazepam before though no okay so tamazepam will be for me because um it's stuck with me till today um my experience with that and i'm sure every pharmacist has a story similar to that involving a dispensing well it's not a dispensing error so giving out handing out error <laughs> more than a dispensing error so um it invokes memories of leadership um patient safety um service um improvement and on all of those because all that um, accumulated in that experience so um, I'll tell you about it um, years ago with my first um, job after um, registration um, in our inpatient pharmacy um, or the outpatient section of the pharmacy um, it's it was weird the setup because the waiting area for patients um, whilst they waited for their medicines to be um, dispensed was in the foyer of the hospital <laughs> so uh, for you to give out medication, you went to the hatch and actually screamed so that the, the patient would hear their name and then come over. Um, so after, you know, checking the medication and handing it out, I went to the hatch and screamed and somebody came over and nodded his head to say that that is his name. And I handed the medication out. And then somebody else came to, to the hatch a few minutes, well, or a long while later to say they're still waiting for the medicine. It's like, but you've already, I've already handed that medicine out or that for that name out. Um, so it turned out that the person I handed it out to really wasn't very fluent in English. And well, that's what we, when we were looking into various reasons why perhaps that might happen. Um, but they just had something they thought was their name and, and they came forward with it. Um, anyway, the person left the hospital and they went home so as soon as I realized what happened I called my um, clinical lead um, and she informed the chief pharmacist who didn't get off and get to <laughs> go to the chief pharmacist's office well I did um, and we got a taxi straight away and um, forwarded ourselves to a patient's address luckily he'd only just got home so we quickly collected the medication back and gave him his own medication and then when we returned obviously you review what happened where the um you know what's contributed to the errors human factors the setup the setting um and you know what contributed to that error happening and we did make some changes and uh, i'm glad i was part of that we did make some changes in terms of the setup of you know the sitting area um ticketing system to make sure that you know you paired things before you get out and so all that happened but in terms of the leadership I'm still in contact with my clinical lead um, because of the way she handled it um, she made me feel quite um, not obviously you're petrified oh my goodness this is yeah. what I've done but she dealt with it in a calm manner um, and that sort of um, gave me confidence to sort of right face up to what had happened and and um, contribute to the improvements that we that we made and um, I think that was really good leadership from my clinical lead at the moment and I always remember that it's, it's not something you forget easily and I quite often tell that to my students as well to say you know that there are factors several factors contribute to errors happening and um some of them you can predict um, and account for mitigate for them, and some of them you can't. But when they do happen, um, 
hopefully there's no negative consequences. Um, you then need to review what factors contributed to that and how you um, improve it so it doesn't happen again. More importantly, Nikki, who was to blame? <laughs> so that's, that, that's, that's the thing with, um, you know, um, systems, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure if there was anybody to blame because in this case, there's a number of things that contributed to that final outcome of that incident happening. Um, so um, he's no- being very negative there. Yeah, Nick. it's a trick he's, question. It's, it's a, a trick, trick question. question. He's, he's pulling your leg. Well, um, so no one was to blame in particular. But if you know about human factors, you know, um, you know, Swiss cheese model. There are several things that contribute. Yeah. To Gim- this is Gimmo's world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and mine in the past. Go on, Gimmo. Well, I was going to say, uh, sorry, I keep referring to past episodes today, but we've talked in the past about the second victim, and pharmacy is really bad at this, in that when a mistake happens, the finger of blame does tend to point at you know either the person who handed the bag over or the pharmacist who's on duty. And you know historically, we do we do point the finger at people. And so, hats off to your clinical supervisor who handled that because it, it, it sounds textbook. Do you want to name check them? I don't mind name checking them. She's still supporting me to today. Um, uh, so her name is Judith Barr. Um, used to be at West Middlesex Hospital. Yeah, well done. Well done to Judith. We like to acknowledge everything that we talk about. So go on, Gimmo. You know, firstly, I think that's an error that most people listening, I know I it, have done something similar or been involved in something similar. You know, I used to work in, well, still do work in Merthyr, where, you know, a huge amount of people were called Jones and we even have people called Jones Jones. Um, and so, so, so it was very easy to make that sort of error. They usually, sometimes it's negligence, but vast majority of cases, it's a systems error. So I think that's a really, I, I like that example. It's a really, really good example. It's nice to hear a positive example of how it should be dealt with, because we have all dealt with many where it's been poorly dealt with. Can I just say as well, the Clinical Pharmacy Congress, we had someone talk about dispensing error and it, it sparked something in the audience as well. I think it they spark really powerful memories, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's great. So the next thing that you get to pick is a career anthem for the Oral Apothecary Spotify playlist, which is on Spotify. So you can search it as well as finding the podcast. So what would you like to offer for this, Nikki? So my choice would be um, living on a prayer. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the reason for that is you need a feel good, you know, music. Um, so if you're in a, uh, yeah, I'll give it away. If you're in a um, supermarket chain pharmacy, you know, during Christmas time, the, you know, the atmosphere is very jolly. You know, everyone's, you know, <laughs> there's no care in the world. You know, it's Christmas time, you know, anything goes. You've got a, a tree made up of chocolates. Um, you know. uh, free to mazapam here. <laughs> A tree, a Christmas tree made up of chocolates that, like, you know, patients just keep handing out and everybody is in a jolly mood. Um, and then, you know, when, usually when that song comes on, um, it's like everyone's waiting for that cue. And, you know, when they go, I'm not going to sing it, but um, it's just, yeah. the, <laughs> you know, the tempo and everyone's like, whoever you've got at the counter is definitely going to join in and sing that song. So I just remember it, you know, during that period, it's, it's I usually like being in a chemistry around that time because um everyone just feels you know very happy festive yeah good choice you know that sadly somebody died from john bon jovi this week didn't he yeah it's not just thrown together <laughs> i remember those long supermarket locums as well nikki those 12 hour 13 14 hour shifts at christmas time hospital pharmacists that used to do locums oh, i'm just gonna say the same thing <laughs> is, that, is that what my dad used to call a sticky bun and paper locum <laughs> You know, you'd have time to have your sticky bun and like pick the winners from for the race in tomorrow. It's where Jamie started his reading habit. <laughs> I used to pick my week of locums very carefully. I go for a, a I'm a, sure you did. A busy one on Monday and Tuesday, a medium one on Wednesday, and then a sticky bun on Thursday. I have a real aversion to Christmas songs, and it, and it's because of the reason you described Nicholas. So I, <laughs> I, that I can remember, and again, this was Mirtha when the Christmas songs would come on, like it seemed like November, and we'd have to you'd have to try and work. And I used to always get my hair off because I thought I can't be a professional under these conditions. And I used to get really wound up about it. The certain Christmas song, I get stressed out just listening to them for that exact same reason. So I'm bar humbug on that one. It can go in, it can go in, but, but reluctantly for me. Well, it's, it's a great song <laughs> for the playlist. Let's be honest. Living on a prayer by Bon Jovi. No problem with that. 
Okay, and the third choice is a book recommendation for the listener for the Oral Apothecary Library, Nikki. Well, I think this one crosses across, you know, those who want to have a really sort of um, history take, um, but relevant to um, medicines, um, actually. Um, So my choice is um, a book by Lucy Ward, just recently published in April. I don't know if you've come across it, um, but I had reviews on it and I had to get it. It's called The Empress and the English Doctor. And it's about events relating to smallpox that happened in the 18th century. Very similar to what we've just gone through with COVID-19. And a lot of the discussions, um, she's she's written it in a very, very lovely sort of um, manner in how she's pulled the events of that time with what we recently went through with COVID-19. And um, really about um, female leadership, but more about how they try to resolve that issue with um so we had vaccinations during COVID-19 and for them at that time was inoculation and you can imagine you know the opera about people you know accepting that that was a way to actually (laughs) eradicate smallpox um and you had the usual arguments that not arguments but the usual you know resistance that we had um with the vaccination currently um and, you know, the different efforts that, you know, people went through to, if you like, reassure people that it was safe to use, including, you know, the high, you know, level people actually taking it and, you know, demonstrating that they've actually taken it and it's safe and all that had to um, happen um, for for people to be encouraged to, to actually be inoculated. Um, it was dreadful disease at that time and similar to what we had it's just the parallels were so compelling for me as I was reading it I would recommend it it's a long read but it's definitely worth it okay so Lucy Ward I just found it the Empress and the English Doctor how Catherine the Great defied a deadly virus well do you remember guys that somebody picked early on in the very first series a book when we were talking about we were well into COVID at that point do you remember who picked Albert Camus the plague mark talbot mark talbot which i think was similar overtones so yeah but we're obviously at least another year down the line since then and does it talk about what we talk about now about vaccine hesitancy i mean they might not have called it that then but do they talk about that it talks about absolutely everything that happened during covid19 including hesitancy including um furlough but not furlough (laughs) furlough Uh, Yes, um, including restricted access um, and all of that. It it does, the parallels are so compelling. Um, And I think what even drew it closer for me, the setting of where the the doctor, the English doctor, um, Thomas Dimsdale lived is not very far from where I live. Oh, okay. (laughs) I'm going out to do some historical... Yeah, to predict the future, study the past. Yes, at the time she was writing it, she did say, obviously, she was writing it during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's how she was able to draw parallels. Really good. That sounds like a really good recommendation. So thank you very much for that. You get a point back because Jamie hasn't read it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. As soon as you said it came out in April, I said, oh, you got him here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> although he's already read the jeremy hunt book so the jeremy hunt is a hardback with big font <laughs> let's not go there say that quickly yeah right okay three excellent choices thank you very much for that nikki so it's me again this week on the micro discussion so this is a interesting paper that was in the british journal of clinical pharmacology in last year and it's a team of people and they're doing quite a lot of work around what I think would be described as very old uh, people, so 85 plus. So I think this is one part of the Newcastle 85 plus study. So Laurie Davis, Andrew Kingston, Adam Todd, and Barbara Hanratty. And it's about is polypharmacy, i.e. lots of medicines, associated with mortality in the very old? And in essence, it is what we call a cohort study. So it followed a load of people in 2006 who were 85 in that year. So they were born in 1921. And so they were 85 in 2006. And they followed them for a whole 11 years. And that's quite a long time in research senses. And so they stopped collecting data in 2017. They looked through GP records and they had health assessments that the people filled in themselves. And they assessed them at a baseline 18, 36, 60 and 120 months. And they were looking for what medicines that person was on on their GP record. 
And as you might imagine, but for the non-healthcare listener, the issue with these sorts of studies is you need to have all the other variables. You need to know, you know, did they smoke? Did they drink alcohol? Uh, what other diseases did they have? They even looked at social deprivation. You know that we like to talk about that on this podcast. They talk about education. They talked about level of disability. So actually, the way it was set up was really good, I think, in an academic sense. And Nikki can, can add to this. But fascinating, what they tried to then do was to say, OK, after 11 years, what they have said in their results is that for every extra medicine, that's a 3% increased risk of death after you remove all the confounding factors of whether you're a smoker or you're drinking or you had X disease or Y disease. And just to make it complete, just because I know the listener is going to want to know this, how many people were still alive when they finished collecting? And the answer was 14%. So 122 out of the original 851. I think what they said, wasn't it, was that for every medicine, it adds... Was it three percent? Yeah, that's what it said. So for every extra medicine, there was a three percent increased risk of death. Nikki, what do you think? So you're, this is, you know, you you research in this area, so you may even have known about this study. But what did you think? So, like I said, it's a longitudinal study, and you know, it's it's in terms of research, it's good to get that trend, that pattern, just to see, you know, what's been happening. And so, if you imagine, this brings in the topic about over prescribing, doesn't it? And de-prescribing, and sometimes, you know. Know, we're trying to de-prescribe these days but obviously if you think back to when the data was collected sometimes um, to resolve side effects of medicines we add another one um, and so if you think about the three percent imagine how many percent that would add up with somebody who had perhaps you know three or four more added on so that just increases um, but I, I think we've got this data now well this data published um, to give to give an idea in terms of the mortality because sometimes you know it's usually we get this data from hospital mostly um, but to get it from sort of the uh, you know longitudinal from GP practice um, I think that's quite good as well because it's um, in terms of research probably more robust than some of the studies who like I've done got it directly from the hospital. They've made a correlation doesn't equal causation does it so they made a big leap. Now, you might have a better idea from this, me, Steve, you're better at reading these sort of papers than me, but they make a big leap in between saying it's, um, so for example, if you're taking an extra medicine, it may be because you developed an extra condition or symptom or disease. So, so I didn't really see how they'd rule that out. Don't get me wrong, we're big fans of de-prescribing, aren't we? And, and, and we, we agree with the general conclusion that you shouldn't be adding medicines, but I just couldn't buy that link that a medicine adds 3% mortality onto someone, um, I think bit more work would be needed before we could say that yeah i mean it is a cohort study so it's not a randomized control trial so the technical phrase here is is that whether or not it's hypothesis forming and it's very well done in relation to how they tried to deal with as nikki's just said what we call a longitudinal so that's quite rare isn't it nikki to see that level of data collected as you just said and so and to be honest you know, it does say that that 3% didn't actually meet statistical significance. So they perhaps slightly over-egged the conclusion, you know, although they tried very hard, as Nikki just said, they still don't know whether or not people were added more medicines because they had more conditions or whether they had to add in more medicines in the prescribing cascade because they were dealing with side effects. So it's part of the bigger picture of this idea of what happens if you take too many medicines as you get older. Because remember that most of the studies, even when these people were put on these drugs, maybe 20 years ago, the studies didn't carry on for 20 years. Even the best clinical trials, randomized control trials we have probably only last for maybe two years, if you're lucky. So there's this whole thing about, do you stop something? And people don't feel confident to do that. But actually, if you look at it, you go, well, you actually have no idea whether or not this is doing any benefit when you've been taking it for 25 years and the event that you took it for was 25 years ago. So it's all part of the mixture of trying to get enough evidence and confidence to, to think about do we need to optimise people's medicines? And I think the bottom line is, is that nobody would disagree that you do need to do that. It's how much evidence are we actually going to be able to find? But it's tricky. But Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely message, isn't it? I mean, that is, what is the soundbite? Um, you know, each each additional prescribed medicine was associated with a 3% increase in the risk of mortality. That's very memorable. Mm. You know, twelve words and and um, or whatever, and it and, and it rolls off the tongue. It, but as Gimmer was pointed out, and they've highlighted that they, you know, yeah. that's what they wanted to be able to say. And it's if we were in the pub talking about it, that's what you'd remember. 
Yeah. But there's, it's so much more nuanced than that. A few things I wrote down, look, I loved Lucy Pollock's quote about medicines fighting with each other as a conversation to have with patients sometimes. It mentions in the paper the law of diminishing returns, and that just takes me back to an exercise that Neil Masquerie used to run with us in his teaching around, you know, what happens when you add the next drug in and the next drug in and, and people think that we're getting this huge benefit, whereas actually we're fighting at the margins for just a tiny, tiny incremental benefit. And that might be the drug that, you know, impacts on the quality of life for a patient, but yet the system and the protocols are doing that to each other. So um, they were my um, thoughts. Look, fewer drugs does not mean less care. And that is something that we need to get across to patients and the system, isn't it? That people think when we're talking about deprescribing or reducing medicine and treatment burden, then yeah, fewer drugs does not mean less care. They, they do say, though, that the line is something around over 85s. We need to think more carefully about polypharmacy and over 85s. And the way they phrased it, I wonder... Sorry, my screen's gone, so I can't see it. The way they phrased it is... Um, I wondered what Lucy Pollock or, or, or you, Nikki, made of it. Because it, for me, it felt a little bit like it goes against that philosophy of thinking, because you're elderly, you don't need these drugs for their clinical effect because it you know benefits you less. I think this is where... The shared decision making comes in as well. Um, and this is where, you know, the expertise of the patient, because they are the experts in their body, they are the experts in the conditions that they have, although we probably have the expertise of the professionals. Um, and this is where that shared decision making really comes into its own to have that discussion with them and not patronizing them and giving them you know, what we're trying to do with the tool, giving them the um, opportunity to, to um, ask the questions. They might not ask the questions, but uh, in a way, you know, prompt them to think about questions that they might want to ask. So you can really sort of reach that decision together with them. At that age, in some of these cases, um, they do have carers as well who are involved. So it's not just the patients. Um, so there's a whole lot of things going on. Um, and some people might be happy happy to stop taking um, and some people might want to continue taking for various reasons and this is what's interesting when I have those conversations but um, I think it's you know coming to a decision together with the patient that's really key as well. Yeah and th this was funded by the National Institute for Health Research so this is a big effort to do this uh, so granted they didn't perhaps get what they were looking for but as a uh, they are very fair in there talking about the limitations contributes well to the narrative doesn't it well said well their previous paper from last year which was published in plus one that's where they use the term or the categories of hyper polypharmacy as well of more than 10 more meds than 10. and you know minor polypharmacy polypharmacy and hyper polypharmacy that was the term i used in the in the introduction so it's just an interesting use of language again isn't it i thought hyper polypharmacy was going to become far more widespread in its use but we don't hear it that often i don't think it there's a term for more than 15 as well but i just I just can't remember what it is right now, but there's a term for more than 15 medicines. And then I think this is a quote from, from one of the papers I've read on the subject over the last week was, look, frailty rather than old age alone is the consideration, isn't it? That uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with these, um, this population. Absolutely. You can have a very fit and healthy, you know, 89 year old uh, who's still playing golf you know, every day and, and such like. So yeah, the frailty element is, is definitely there. But anyway, we thought we'd put it into the micro discussion this week with Nikki's interest in older people and our general interest in the need to review medicines. I mean, I guess that's really what we're everyone's saying about this subject matter and hoping that single organologists might finally catch up. A big thank you to Nikki for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing her stories, her drug of choice, her career anthem and her book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Professor Mahendra Patel. Mahendra is a multi-award winning pharmacist and academic recognised nationally and internationally. He just might be a national treasure. We look forward to catching up with Mahendra next time on the Oral Apothecary. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. Don't forget to get in touch with your questions that might come into a future episode in a month or six weeks' time. We're on LinkedIn. You can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Gimmo now for the final ingredient. Thanks, Nikki. That was fantastic. Our theme, I think, for the final ingredient this term has been um, non-medicines interventions. So I work in improvement and the two solutions I hear the most to problems is educate people, which we've talked about doesn't work, and let's invent an app which often doesn't work as well but but actually here's an app that might work so hundreds of thousands of people suffer from insomnia in england 
could be offered treatment via an app instead of sleeping pills under new guidelines from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. Trials have shown that Sleepio is more effective than usual treatments, advice on sleep hygiene and sleeping pills. It's been shown to lead to fewer GP appointments and NICE concluded that Sleepio would save the NHS money and reduce patients' reliance on drugs. The programme doesn't come cheap well, relatively cheap. It costs £45 a head. And that involves sleep tests, sleep diary, and weekly interactive cognitive behavioural therapy sessions. Designed to be completed in six months, but patients prescribed it will have access to it for 12 months. I'm always cautious with apps, but if NICE is recommending it, then maybe there is an app for that. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. Warning, harmless if digested. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by jamiehayes.co.uk. Mm-hmm.